thank you. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you guys for coming. I know it's uh, turning out to, to be a wet night here. Thank you guys for organizing. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, in the crypto world, there are a lot of super ambitious infrastructure projects. We guys went to DevCon. Uh, most of the talks are really around infrastructure. A lot of people here that I just met are working on very inf interesting infrastructure. But um, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, today about our experiences on the other side of the fence, in the corner of being an application developer uh, in the crypto ecosystem, and one that's built quite a popular uh, dApp here. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm old. I have been around the startup uh, ecosystem quite a long time. Previously co-founded two venture-backed startups. First one didn't work out that well. Second one we sold in 2016, which means I'm relatively new to the blockchain world. That startup was not, didn't have anything to do with it. But I also have never had more fun than working with uh, the Idex founders and team on this stuff. So. Here's the plan. Uh, we're going to walk through what is IDEX and also what it isn't, um, how it works, uh, and then we're going to actually dive into the code. So a chunk of the platform is, in fact, an Ethereum smart contract, which we'll get into the nuts and bolts of. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the real world impacts of the uh, constraints and limitations of Ethereum on our ability to actually operate. And then, of course, uh, share what we learned about those and how we've mitigated them. Uh, a note before I move on, though. So uh, IDEX is the launch product of a company called Aurora Labs. Uh, we have a much broader vision around decentralized finance. Um, IDEX is purely a product of that. IDEX also has its own uh, ambitious plans around decentralization and some interesting protocols that we're working on. But the part I want to talk today is just uh, the part of being the application developer side of things. So what is IDEX? Uh, it's a hybrid decentralized exchange operating in Ethereum and trading ERC-20 tokens. Uh, it is not affiliated with ZeroX, so we're independent. Um, it's a novel design and um, ultimately came out of uh, kind of a, a focus on relentless uh, pragmatism in the compromises we're willing to make in order to achieve a uh, great experience. So before I kind of dive into things, who here is familiar with IDEX? Cool. And have you guys traded on IDEX at all? Awesome. Okay, fantastic. I uh, believe it is. Okay. Are we good? Okay, fantastic. All right. So as I mentioned, we have a philosophy of, uh, of just pragmatic compromises. We are not purists in terms of needing to necessarily have uh, the most decentralization or um, necessarily the, uh, any sort of those elements uh, that underlie blockchain. What we really want to achieve is a great balance that yields a great user experience with this product. So one of the axes of differentiation uh, amongst exchanges, you guys are probably familiar, is decentralization. So. On the one hand, you have the really large exchanges, which tend to be centralized, so your finances, et cetera. Um, and those are great from a user experience perspective. Of course, kind of the key element there is that in order to get the great user experience they have, you have to send them your money. <laughs> Once you send it to them, it's in some ways not really yours. It's just accounted for by them for you. Uh, the great thing about this from a user experience perspective is that settlement happens instantaneously. They have the funds. They say, great. Database just says, Here are the, here's who these funds are allocated to, and we're done. The problem is, of course, security. Uh, there have been a lot of hacks in the space. You guys well know. I don't need to be a dead horse here. But the numbers are pretty staggering. So Wall Street Journal published an article uh, earlier this year that in the first top of 2018, over $750 million US dollar equivalent was stolen from exchanges uh, just in those six months. So it's not a theoretical problem. It's a very real problem from a security perspective. On the other end of the spectrum, we have decentralized exchanges. And the idea here, in a pure sense, is that the funds would never leave your wallet until you actually make the trade. And so they're in your wallet. Security is as good as it can possibly be. It's exceptionally good. Um, but the problem that most decentralized designs have is user experience. Uh, due to the performance characteristics of the underlying blockchains, you end up with problems such as low throughput, high latency, and high cost to execute any actions. So uh, in a pure decentralized design, it's nearly unworkable, which is to say if you have your order book uh, on-chain as well as all your settlement and uh, funds trading, you have to both wait for uh, settlement as well as uh, pay gas for placing an order as well as canceling an order, which means it's essentially impossible to run any sort of algorithmic strategies, et cetera. So 
people have walked along the spectrum at different points of the trade-off, including moving the order book offline, moving settlement online, and so forth and so on. We, when we launched, had a completely novel set of trade-offs here that we believe really hit the 80-20 point on both of those fronts. So in particular, so the 20% part on the decentralized front is that the funds do not sit in your wallet until they trade. So that is the 20% that we've given up. However, they're not custodied in some sort of black box, they're custodied in our smart contract online. It's completely transparent, it's actually quite simple as we'll look at it, um, but the security is excellent. We've never lost a dime uh, for customers from that contract. Uh, which private key? There's actually a few private keys, which we'll get into as well. Um, but there are, yes, we control some private keys, but they actually don't allow us to take any funds, of course. Um, the other side of it is user experience. So how do we get the 80-20 user experience? So what we want to be able to do is let people trade as if it feels like a centralized exchange. So we have a design that allows people to trade in real time uh, and to continue trading and then allow settlement to happen on chain eventually, which means um, hopefully quite quickly within minutes, but uh, depending on on uh, what kind of congestion we're seeing and so forth, that can extend longer. But um, we believe we've hit that 80 20 point, and uh, I think the results kind of speak for themselves. You know, we have by far the most adoption of any DEX out there. Um, we're uh, the number one by volume, by users, by transactions, pretty much you name it, and have been for the last eight months or so. Um, I should mention that we launched uh, in October of 2017, so it's a little over a year now. Uh, the product was essentially a prototype at launch. Which means, uh, in the meantime, we kind of hit the, the, the curve of the hockey stick in December or so. We've been growing really rapidly ever since, which means we've had some really great, fun times taking what effectively is a prototype MVP and bringing that up to uh, the ability to scale to the, to the level that we need it. And we'll be sharing some of those uh, findings with you guys in a minute. OK, so that's what we're talking about. How does it work? So I want to really emphasize, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on here, but I want to emphasize that fundamentally, IDEX is a simple product. And I think that's part of its success as well, because again, you know, in relatively nascent uh, times in terms of the underlying blockchain technology, keeping things simple is one of the ways that we've been able to keep it running and keep it on track. Um, there are two fundamental components. So we have our on-chain components, which are the pieces up here, which essentially are just a smart contract. Uh, the smart contract handles things like custodying funds, uh, handling deposits and withdrawals, um, validating trades, and so forth. The off-chain components, which are run in normal AWS-style uh, software, um, do things like manage the order book, validate trades, dispatch uh, settlements to the blockchain, and so forth and so on. So I think it's worth taking a quick second to walk through how some of these, how some of these key operations actually work in our system. I know there's kind of a lot going on on this, uh, on this diagram here, so we can kind of work through it really quickly. Um, importantly, the key to our security here is that no funds can move without the private key signature of the user at the other end of the trade. So um, whether that's a trade, whether that's a draw, whatever it is. And then additionally, funds can only be withdrawn to the wallet from which they originally came. So in that capacity, it's quite airtight in terms of the ability to take funds from the contract. Um, important concept, we talk about makers and takers internally. In makers for us are the folks putting order, limit orders on the books. Takers are people that are matching those orders and taking the other side of them and, uh, and making the trade complete. So really quick, working through these lifecycle items, uh, deposits, effectively, that is just a normal um, function you call on the contract. Uh, nothing special about it, really straight ahead. Nothing else happens. The one, uh, the one piece of the puzzle that does happen off-chain is we have a uh, deposit scanner that basically sits there and reads those uh, blocks coming out and the events coming out of those blocks and says, great, let's update our balances in our off-chain state to match those. So essentially, we're synchronizing our off-chain and on-chain state. So when you place an order, what's happening here is the maker, as you'll see, there's no connection in, this is number three here. So there's no connection between the maker and the contract when they place an order. What they're doing is they're taking the parameters, signing the whole thing with their key, you know, pops up in MetaMask or your ledger, whatever it happens to be, sends it to our server, server validates your balances are right, validates the signatures match up, et cetera, puts it on the books. When uh, you cancel an order, that means it's a really simple operation. Oh, there you go. So three, yeah, there's a lot going on here. When you cancel an order, really simple operation. So uh, all you're doing is we just update the row in the database, it's canceled, done. So again, these things have made placing and uh, removing orders, you know, millisecond level operations, not minute level operations, which is, of course, exactly what you want. 
taking a trade works the exact same way. So you say, hey, great, this is the order I want to take. Let me sign the whole thing with my, uh, with my signature. We're going to send it to your server. It's going to validate the balance, going to validate the signature off chain, and then say, okay, everything checks out. And we're going to send it to dispatch into the Ethereum network uh, where the contract itself runs the same validations. So it's validated on both sides there. And then ultimately, we'll say, great, and settle. And then once we, uh, once we see that you know, six blocks or so have gone by, we credit everything settled, and we're good to go. But importantly, in that window, the, both participants of that trade can continue trading uh, without worrying that that's going to settle. And I'll get into how we can guarantee that uh, in a second. Withdraws actually go through our uh, off-chain components. So in order to withdraw, um, either party will submit a withdrawal request. Again, has to be signed uh, by their private key, validated against balances, submitted to the contract. Contract sends the funds back to your wallet, and you're good to go. So um, with that being said, and right before we jump into uh, the actual contract logic itself, I'd like to walk through one issue uh, that um, projects into a number of areas of the contract that you'll see uh, in a minute. So let's talk about mining race conditions. So if we take an A view of just saying, OK, cool, we can dispatch willy-nilly, we don't have to worry about it, we're under the problem that mining is probabilistic. We don't know which order things are going to mine in. So really quick, we can, we can go through an example of showing you how this is going to be a problem. So let's say we have our initial balances here of uh, you know, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And the first trade that they want to do is Alice and Bob are going to trade 10 Ether for 100 ore. Great. Sounds good. Next trade, uh, Bob turns around, trades 9 Ether for another 100 ore of Charlie, makes an ETH in the process. Great. At which point, he decides, you know what? I'm actually going to withdraw my, my ore from the exchange contract, and we're good. And so that's all great. However. Remember that we have both an off-chain state and an on-contract state. And those things need to be synchronous. Otherwise, things get into trouble quickly. So going through this really simple example, let's say we are now attempting to synchronize these things with some sort of mechanism for settlement. Again, our initial balances, let's say they start synchronized. Everything's been read correctly from the chain, et cetera. Now let's say, unfortunately, transaction three mines first. So what's going to happen on contract is those funds are, are gone. Those funds are going to actually get dispatched back to the wallet, and they're no longer there. Which means, let's say transaction one gets mined second, that's going to get reverted. Because those funds are no longer there, the contract's going to read it, it's going to throw, and we're going to bounce. What happens in contract when transaction two is? Again, the funds are not sufficient to actually make the trade, validation fails, uh, and the transaction reverts. Which means our end state balances here do not match between our off-chain and on-chain components. As you can imagine, because we let people trade well, well ahead of settlement, uh, if you let that keep going for any significant amount of time, the dependency graph there can get really messy really fast, and this is not good. So we have a bunch of mechanisms uh, that we can talk about about how we actually deal with that. But in short, the way we deal with this is we have off-chain components that establish a canonical order of uh, serialization. So essentially, as these trades come in, remember I said that they're validated both in the uh, off-chain components as well as the on-chain components. The reason they're validating the off-chain components is that we can fail those within milliseconds and tell people, oh, by the way, that order's already taken, or you don't have enough balance, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, once that canonical order is set in the off-chain, we actually control the calls to trade and withdraw via smart game. This is, uh, I think, what Terry may have been mentioning here, which is that we have a special dispatch wallet, right? So we have a wallet that only uh, can make those calls, and as a result, we can use the nonce mechanism at the Ethereum protocol level to ensure that those things get mined in the correct order, if that makes sense. Any questions? What about a chain reorder? Pardon? What if you have a chain reorder? Uh, I'm not sure. Good question. What if it resets to a USD or All right. So, with that, let's jump into the actual contract. And I want to first say, so this is uh, our smart contract. You can take a look at it. It's on Etherscan, obviously, verified. Uh, first thing I'd like to point out, though, really importantly, is the length. It is a total of 184 lines, including white space and comments. It's really short. It's really simple, uh, and it's really focused. It doesn't call anything else. It's purely self-contained. Uh, and we, we can walk through it in a matter of minutes. And I think 
this is one of the things that's been saving grace, a saving grace for us because it's actually quite easy to reason about in terms of, oh yeah, sure thing. Is that good? Great. Okay, so why don't we take a quick walk down this thing. So uh, we got a bunch of boilerplate safe math functions on top. We have um, a few um, points of contract storage here. So I will come back to invalid order in a second. Um, but we have a really simple modifier for only, only owner. Uh, again, um, pretty standard stuff here. I will come back to invade, invalidate orders before. Um, but the first line, line 57 here, is uh, how we store our token balances. Really simple mapping. Um, we've got a list of our admins. Uh, I think that had uh, some overlapping effects here. All right. So we uh, have our admins. We have our last active transaction. Again, I'll come something. I'll come back to it. Order fills. Uh, order fills helps us understand um, how much of an order is taken. We we support partial fills, of course. Uh, the fee account, which is uh, just an address to which fees uh, get transferred. Um, the inactivity release period, uh, which, again, it has uh, something to do with the last active transaction, but I'll come back to it. Uh, traded is just the storage of the hashes of everything that's been traded, and it acts as a uh, replay uh, prevention mechanism. Same with withdrawn. And then a uh, number of events. So not a whole lot going on there. You'll note only admin. Uh, it's similar to only owner, except uh, we can specify a list of admins. That's actually how we specify the dispatch wallet. It's something we can change because, again, as a hot wallet that sits on our off-chain software, if there's any sort of concern around compromise, we can just change that out in the contract and we're good to go, and only the owner can do that. Um, but let's work through the key functions here. So deposit. Uh, as you can see, there's two different functions for deposit token and deposit. Uh, they just update the balance. Um, they update the last active transaction and then make the actual transfer and throw an event. Really simple stuff. We, of course, have this built into our client to make it really seamless, um, but you could call these from anything. So we don't control the deposits. Anyone can deposit whatever they want. And then, as I mentioned, how we synchronize that is that we just uh, read everything that's coming off the blockchain and make sure that those balances are matched up. Withdraw. You'll note that there are two withdraw functions. So. This is where uh, this last, act last active transaction idea comes into play. So admin withdraw is the normal way to withdraw. So that is submitted from our off-chain software. It's validated by our off-chain software. We have the ability to turn that on and off, et cetera. It's not a great design as a decentralized exchange or even a hybrid decentralized exchange if we can prevent people from getting their money back. And so built into this is a safeguard of the normal withdrawal function, which, as you'll note, does not have any sort of only admin modifier to it. However, what we do have is a mechanism that says a certain number of blocks, so the inactivity release period, needs to go by before people can do that. And we call this the escape hatch, right? So even if we turn everything off, if we disappear, if you know, all, all of our servers go away forever, everyone will be able to get back their money after a certain period of time. And that's a guarantee built into the contract. We have a few of these safety mechanisms here to ensure, again, uh, safety of funds for ultimately our end users. So it's really simple. Basically, just tests, hey, are we past that block? Great. Uh, do you have the tokens? Great. And then reduce the amount of tokens, actually make the, con actually make the transfer, and you're done. All right, add one withdraw. So this is the normal way to withdraw. And it gets into some of the basic ideas that I was talking about before. So you'll note it's an only admin function, which means that only we can call it from our dispatcher. Uh, the first thing it's going to do is hash all these elements. So um, as you'll see in line 123, we're just hashing those elements. When you actually do that transaction on the site, it's literally just going to pop up at, at the window on MetaMask or Ledger, or whatever you're using, and just take that hash, say, do you sign that, yes or no? Great, you sign it. That's what get this that gets dispatched. Uh, line 124 is the nonce uh, replay, replay attack prevention. So you'll note that the nonce is part of that hash. So if you tried to replay that, it would bounce it. We store it again. And then we validate the signature in line 126. 
Uh, we make sure that the fees cannot be above a certain limit. Does anyone know why it is that we charge fees on withdraw here? Or you guys, can you guys take a guess? You guys? I know it's not just because we want to be greedy. So the short answer is uh, because we have to, we have to dispatch that, um, we ultimately pay gas for withdrawals, right? Because that's a wallet that we control. And so in order to offset the gas cost, we actually build that in and just charge the user that much more and then take that back as fees. And so um, there's some interesting mechanisms around gas and how we price that in order to ensure that our dispatch can run smoothly. But anyway, that's how, that's how and why fees are involved in withdrawals. Um, we actually reduce the amounts, make the transfers, uh, update the last active transaction, and we're good to go. So again, really simple. And the last piece of the puzzle is trading. So look, there's more going on here, but again, you'll see it's really similar to what's happening with draw. So we have you know, our trade values and trade addresses arrays. Um, I'll walk through this briefly just to kind of get to the points where you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, but really, this is about as straightforward as you can make things. So, uh, so we're just saying, um, is this an invalid order? Uh, that is a mechanism I'll come back to in a second. So we have a concept when you cancel. Uh, it's another safety feature that I think will be worth touching on. But what we do is we first hash the order. So this is the maker side of things, right? So when you look at one, 163, we basically, all that stuff that that person signed uh, through the client or through the API, we're hashing that, and then we're testing to make sure that, in fact, that was something that they signed, so it's validated on chain. The taker side of things, same thing. So it says, okay, great, what is that order hash? What are the other values that the taker put in there? You know, how much, to, how much of that order they're taking and so forth? Test the signature, great. Uh, line 167, 168, prevent replay attacks. Again, it's the same idea as withdraw. We have the nonces in there. We hash it, we stick it in uh, storage, and we say, has it ever been seen before? No, great. Um, we have some validation to ensure that we can't run away crazy with fees on, on 169 and 170. So there's, uh, there's limits on what the fees can actually be. And then we basically just get into the actual transfers. So uh, there's a little bit of math involved uh, in setting you know, basically the, the correct balances on either side of the coin uh, or token, I guess, uh, the fees, etc. And then um, You'll note there's an order fills line, so 171 uh, tests the order fills, which says you know, if you're doing a partial fill, uh, let's make sure that we're not exceeding the overall order value. Uh, one line 180 is actually where we fill that back in. Uh, we update the last active transaction for both users, and we're done. So really, that is not a whole lot of logic to do it, but it's validated in all the important ways that need to be validated and prevents any sort of the attacks that we, uh, we are aware of. So, the one last piece of the puzzle I think is kind of an interesting twist here is invalidating orders before. So this is an interesting uh, idea. So you'll note that the first test in the trade was, does this fall afoul of the invalid order for the user, right? So what's happening here, there is a, a known problem with this approach, which is that, remember I said you can cancel orders with a uh, you know, millisecond level call? What's happening there is, of course, we're just putting a cancel timestamp in a database row, right? Totally fine, gets the job done. But it opens up an attack vector, which is that if we are compromised on the off-chain components, somebody can go in, these are signed orders, right? The signature's there, everything they need to actually pass validation in the contract could be sent to the contract. So if somebody gets their hands on them, that means that they could take orders that would be uh, unnaturally advantageous to them, given whatever time frame they're looking at from just examining the, the orders table. That's not really ideal, again, because we want to ensure that funds can never be stolen here. So we have a function on the site called mining cancels, which means users can go in and they can say, great, click the button, mine cancels. And what it actually does is it calls this function, evaluate orders before. So it sets a nonce for the user up to a certain point, which means that any open cancels that are on the books from that user have to all be closed. It sets the nonce, and then in our client UI, we have, as a convenience, the ability to then re-sign all the orders they go back on the book. Now, so that's a little bit annoying, um, but what it does is it guarantees that none of your canceled orders could ever be taken if somebody were to compromise our systems. It hasn't happened yet, that's great, but we want to make sure and encourage users to do this. The reason we don't do it automatically is, of course, it costs gas. And so we don't want to do it on every cancel. We want to leave it up to the user to say, look, you know, I'm not really too worried about this, or you know what, I do this every day, or I do this every hour, or whatever they want to do. Um, so 
kind of an interesting twist in the contract logic. But again, as you can see, it's a mixture of pure validation and some safety measures to ensure that, again, users' funds are never compromised. Any questions? Cool. All right. So, with that being said, uh, I think you know we'll probably agree that the on-chain logic for Redux is actually pretty simple. Um, but you know, even simple things in the blockchain world can get kind of complicated and go off the rails when you actually deploy them in practice and uh, see some real usage and so forth. So, uh, I'd like to take a little bit deeper look into how it is that that. Uh, squaring away between the off-chain components and the on-chain components really comes together. And that's a process we call dispatch. Um, and in the dispatcher, uh, it has a few different responsibilities. So it is, uh, manages the uh, dispatch wallet, which is a hot wallet that sits on our servers, and actually uh, can make those calls to the, to the contract that anyone else can. It also uh, monitors those transactions as they progress through the various stages of mining and confirmation and then how many blocks and so forth and so on. Um, it deals with rebroadcasts. So rebroadcasting is an interesting question uh, with regards to gas. Um, and as a result, you end up, if you look at Etherscan, you end up with a little bit of an odd pattern here, which is that uh, you'll see a ton of transactions from IDEX underscore two, which is the name for our uh, dispatch wallet, right? So that's what it looks like. It's pretty hard to see what's going on. Whenever you see something that's not from IDEX two, it's probably because it's a deposit. Um, and I don't know if you guys have dug too much into this, but you know the nonce is a protocol level thing. So if you click into any of these things, you'll, it'll show you what nonce we're talking about here. It's a protocol level uh, mechanism that allows us to synchronize us. So awesome, problem solved, looks good on paper, works great on the test net. Uh, unfortunately, you encounter a few problems with this uh, whole structure when you start reaching any sort of decent volume or uh, congestion on the network. So the way that usually plays out is you'll be sitting there, you're looking at your metrics, you have your, your dashboards up, and you'll see the number of transactions that were dispatched is growing and growing and growing and growing, and never anything being mined that shrinks that queue. And so, okay, a couple dozen are out there, no problem. A couple hundred are out there, mm, this is getting kind of concerning. A couple thousand are out there, like, okay, this is like a multi-hour delay between when people are trading and settlement, right? This is not good. So what are your choices here? Like, how do you actually deal with this problem when you're facing this, uh, whether it happens to be some sort of crazy network conditions, or are you sure that something's broken with the way you're dispatching? What's going on, right? There is no, it's decentralized. There's no actual view in a global state of what's happening here. So uh, you have a few options, and I'll walk through in a second. But I think before we do, it's worth just reviewing exactly what is, is happening when that dispatch actually happens. So you have your ETH node. You call send tran uh, transaction to the ETH node, you get a receipt back. From there on out, kind of black box, right? You're saying, okay, cool. Maybe you're sitting on Etherscan, maybe you're looking for the uh, pending transaction pool. It's not showing up, maybe it is showing up, maybe it's not getting mined, right? At any one of these points in time, you don't really know exactly what's going on here. Well, what is going on here is, of course, you have your ETH nodes, or you're using a hosted service, whether it's paid or unpaid. Uh, those are connected to whatever peers they're connected to. Um, they go into something called the transaction pool, which is uh, similar to Bitcoin, but um, with a few Ethereum twists. Uh, so ideally, if you, are, if you set up your ETH node correctly, they are marked as local transactions, which means they have special status and they can't be booted uh, from the transaction pool because of uh, additional uh, volume and traffic going through there. Um, eventually, these things propagate. Um, propagation is its own question. Are they propagating? Maybe, maybe not. Eventually they get to a miner. So a miner is selecting a set of these, uh, predominantly based on gas costs, that they're gonna put into a block, create the block, and then we're waiting for confirmation. Seems kind of simple in theory, um, but you end up uh, with interesting challenges at each step along the way. So, for your ETH node. Um, when we start looking at these things, we've tried pretty much every, every uh, possible configuration of ETH nodes, service providers, hosted ones, ones we run ourselves, you name it. Um, so first things first, one of the real challenges if you don't run your own is getting the CPU and RAM balance right is not obvious because your workload is your workload. 
um, your performance constraints are your performance constraints. And if you don't know what those things are and you can't see those things, you don't have any insight into what's going on, especially if it's a black box, you're saying, okay, great, I don't know what configuration they're running or how they're doing this. We don't know if it's even provisioned correctly. If it's not provisioned correctly, it's gonna take a super long time to sync uh, with the chain and may fall behind, may lose peers, et cetera. The two primary metrics of health that we always look at are kind of your current block. So are we trailing blockchain, which is not good for a lot of obvious reasons, and peer count. So we have settled on a solution where we're running uh, several hundred peers on the production nodes um, in order to get really good characteristics uh, to get this to propagate here. Um, Incidentally, that requires some non-trivial hardware. We found that the uh, R5 instances are actually pretty ideally matched for our particular workload for uh, CPU and RAM uh, on the ETH node front. Which R5s? What's an R5? That's uh, an EC2, yeah, class of instance. Okay, propagation and congestion. This is probably the biggest black box in this whole system because, again, when you transmitted all these things, like literally, let's say you have thousands of these things outstanding, you're like, okay, great, they're not showing up in a pending pool. What on earth is going on? So you can look, there's a little bit of inspection, if you're running your own nodes, you can get a little bit of data out of them to understand what's happening in their transaction pool, but that doesn't really matter, right? What you're worried about is what is happening in the rest of the network. We want our transactions to get to the miners, and that's what we really care about, right? Um, the thing is that propagation is effectively random. So there are standards within, if you look at you know, your geth code, wherever it is, uh, that say there are certain conditions under which gas does determine what gets booted out of the pool. So if there's contention for transaction pools, uh, gas can have an, an impact there, but what actually gets propagated is effectively random. So there's very little leverage you can pull to actually make that happen. Okay, so congestion, not ideal. Uh, remember I mentioned actually the one thing that of local, if you mark your transactions as local, one of the things that they will not be booted from the transaction pool, which is why it's really important to make sure that you're using a node configuration where uh, in fact that has been turned off in the flags. So, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, no. I mean, you know, these things, we had over a period of months, we really started building some hypotheses around what was going on and then went and, you know, dug through source code, uh, talked to, you know, folks that are operating, you know, much larger kind of, you know, uh, as a service type uh, node infrastructures and things of that nature to try to piece together a picture and experimentally ended up with a system that tends to work quite well uh, in practice. But effectively there isn't, right? The whole thing about the transaction pool, it's decentralized, right? And you don't, you don't end up with any sort of consensus until it's actually a block. And so, you know, it's kind of a black box to see what's really gonna happen in there. Uh, we have not, actually. That's a good question, though. Um, yeah. Uh, currently, we have sort of tried, like I said, everything under the sun. Currently, we're running Geth. Um, although we actually use Parity for some internal development purposes, too. Yes, we, we only broadcast the immediately connected peers for each instance, right? So we don't, we all we're worried about, but of course, you know, requirements, the, the actual instance requirement scales with how much your how much peer traffic you're doing with, right? Right, I mean, well, so actually, uh, that, is, that is a strategy. Um, so, you know, peering with miners directly, but of course that requires the miners to okay that, and miners tend to be, you know, pretty neutral in terms of their, I think reasonably so, in terms of their willingness to kind of affiliate either way. So, but in, in mining, so that's its own question there, right? So again, uh, you end up in this similar situation of saying, okay, um, now you've gotten into a miner's transaction pool, um, you need to actually be selected. Usually that's uh, just a function of your gas price. They just take whatever's high, put it in a block, mine it, that's great. 
Rebroadcast is an interesting issue. So if you find stuck transactions, obviously you can replace the transaction. I guess are probably familiar with it, but basically as long as it comes in the same, you do the same nonce, everything's good. You can rebroadcast it with more gas. Uh, usually the gas has to be over 10% more to propagate. But then keep in mind, that's just a new transaction that's replacing whatever's in the transaction pools and needs to propagate itself. So it's, again, because propagation is random, it is not scaled by gas or not prioritized by gas, it's not really a lever that's so easily pulled when you find yourself in this position of you know, operational emergency of saying, okay, we have a several thousand node backlog here, what are we doing? Um, and then finally, obviously, there's confirmation and you know, the possibility that we need to wait a certain number of blocks and confirm that that is, in fact, what the chain is going to look like and we're good to go. And so we need to monitor that as well. Now, that's all well and good, except for the nonce issue. So this all gets considerably more complicated because of the fact that we have to process things serially and they need to be mined serially and the nonce is the enforcement mechanism for which that happens. So again, things like propagation tend to become much more of an issue. So here's essentially the problem that we face on the propagation front. So when you talk about uh, propagation, again, if you're just talking about a single transaction that, that's not really dependent on anything else, okay, that's fine. You can rebroadcast it, it will go through eventually, etc. When you're talking about, let's call it several hundred transactions that are all sequential in their nonce, and they're all getting propagated uh, in a basically random manner through this network, you don't have to just get your transaction to a miner with the right gas. You need to get the first transaction of that nonce chain to the miner in the gas. And of course, keep in mind, you know, we have a whole uh, part of our product that monitors gas and gas prices, and we have an algorithm that determines what they ought to be dispatched at. Remember, um, our users are not paying for gas, we're paying for the gas, but we need to pick a sufficiently high rate that it's very unlikely that if we get to a mining pool, we will not be selected. Um, it's probabilistic, you can't guarantee it. But just getting to the miners not enough, you need to have the first three nonces there with the right amount of gas that get selected in the block. So you can very easily end up in situations like this, where you end up with, great, so you have a fragmented picture, you have some non-mining nodes that have different pieces of the puzzle. You have a miner that's got a few sequential ones, but they don't have the ones that they need to actually go ahead and mine. What can happen in periods of high congestion is those can actually get booted from their mining pool, meaning it takes multiple cycles of them entering and getting moved from the mining pool before they actually have a sufficient set of, uh, of transactions with sufficient gas to get mined. So uh, this can be a pretty significant problem. And the real, the real lessons from here are pretty clear. So the first thing is to not let that load get so high, right? So one of the things that we had hypothesized that this is what was going on here, and what we've implemented is a system where we essentially limit the number artificially of outstanding transactions that are dispatched. So a dispatcher can say, great, we've established the canonical order of these trades off chain, but on chain, we're only going to ever release up to n transactions that are that we got receipts for that are propagating and go for minor. The reason is really simple. Let's say you have a thousand transactions out there and they're propagating essentially randomly. It's a lot harder to get number one to a minor than if you only have twenty outstanding, because then you're just saying, okay, great. Like, which ones of these are actually going to get propagated? Well, you have a higher probability if you just reduce the number that are outstanding of getting a proper set that can can mine directly. Second. Uh, don't load balance. So if you think about it, if you run a traditional load balancer, the round robin style balancing, and that's how you're dispatching to your nodes, uh, you're immediately introducing fragmentation into the way that those nonces are actually getting allocated into the, uh, into the network. And finally, by reducing those, you actually increase the probability. So by reducing the set that's outstanding, you actually increase the probability that uh, rebroadcasting with higher gas can have some impact here, right? Because now you're saying, okay, cool, there's only 20 outstanding, perfect. I can rebroadcast all of those with 1.5x gas, it's much more likely, again, that that small set will get there and propagate and get mined. And you don't have to worry about the problem of saying, great, I have 1,000 dispatched. Over that period of time, gas is spiked because there's tons of congestion. The first few are now at a very low gas because that's what we thought it was at the time that it happened. The congestion happened and now the last few are at high gas, but they're all still stuck behind the ones at low gas. Not really what you want. It allows you to control your gas costs much more closely. So to kind of summarize the lessons learned of operating uh, this kind of application uh, across the, the current state of the art in technology, and obviously, like I said in the beginning, there are tons and tons of amazing infrastructure improvements coming down the pipe, but today, this is how we have to operate. So first, you have to self-host full nodes. Um, and again, like I mentioned, you just don't know what's on the other side 
of even great hosted solutions or paid hosted solutions um, or anything. Um, fail over sequentially. So again, remember, the problem with load balancing is that you're fragmenting your non-set right from the beginning. But you need redundancy, because if you don't have redundancy, uh, this game, you're in even worse shape than if you're having a bunch of transactions floating around there not in any sort of mining pool. You haven't even set the transactions at all if you don't have any sort of real connection to an RPC endpoint. So what we've, we change our entire approach to say, okay, great, obviously we need to run multiple nodes for redundancy. They all have their own kind of floating node count, or uh, peer count and um, you know, current block that we monitor for health. And then we have the ability to quickly fail over to one if we need to. Um, important uh, operational concern. Batch transactions. So again, this idea of limiting the number of outstanding transactions that are there if you have any sort of high volume uh, serial dispatch that's uh, dependent on the nonce. Uh, really important consideration. One area that we have explored but haven't yet rolled out is um, actually employing multiple dispatch wallets. So again, uh, there are dependency graphs within these trades. So uh, some of these trades are related, some of them are not related. And for the ones that are not related, there actually isn't any problem with dispatching them in parallel and just letting them get mined in whatever probabilistic order happens because they're not, there's no dependencies between them. Identifying how those graphs ultimately get built out and then dispatching accordingly is something that we basically have a uh, proof of concept for, but again, you know, operationally we've kind of hit a point of stability with, uh, with some of these things to say, you know, okay, great, let's go solve some of the other many uh, challenges and interesting uh, things that are going on. And then finally, <coughs> you know, in some ways, uh, gold standard would be peering with miners, but again, you know, that's much less of a technical question, more of a, all right, great, do miners want to peer with you? And uh, so, a little bit out of my scope here. So with that, um, that's mostly what I wanted to cover in terms of operations and so forth. Um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Now I'd like to turn it over to Q&A. That means uh, questions about you guys. You so we haven't yet. What's the strategy for that? Uh, it is going to be a process of having people, uh, everyone withdraw and deposit a new one. So there's no, like as, as you saw, it's, there's no upgradability built into the contract. Uh, it's not a two contract solution, you know, where one, one has validation and one custodies, um, partly because the gas costs uh, of calling between those obviously get increased. So, and then finally, you know, the, the initial contract deployed is extremely simple. And that's one of the reasons that we could have confidence that when we deploy it, that we're like, okay, this is so simple that we're quite sure that we're right. You know what I mean? And as soon as you start layering uh, any more complexity into that, that assurance goes down quite a lot, quite quickly. So, um, yeah, we've, we have not yet, you know, knock on wood, uh, haven't had any vulnerabilities and haven't had to do it yet. So, yeah, what's it? How is it better than Cerex from user perspective? I mean, so basically Cerex. Pardon? Cerex. Yeah. Kyber. How you better? So for us, you know, again, we, we have the step of taking funds and putting it in a contract, which means that we can have this real-time trading experience and everything is guaranteed to settle in the order in which it happens. So effectively, there's just a lag time between that. But the user experience is really fantastic. It's basically as close as you can get to a centralized exchange in the decentralized world today. And so all of the compromises have been basically made around the fact of like, how can we make the user experience of trading on IDEX as good as possible? So that's essentially uh, how we've looked at it. Well, if you think just from like the block confirmation time, right, it's a minimum of effectively a minute and a half, right? Even, even it got mined immediately, but you know, it doesn't really happen. So, you know, if you're talking like on the low side minutes, right, on the high side, there's really no bound it could be theoretically, right? For us, you know, it's kind of one of those operational concerns of just like keeping an eye on things. And, you know, obviously we have alerts set up. We have all sorts of kind of infrastructure in place to make sure that, you know, if things tend to be stacking up, that somebody's paying attention to it. Um, but again, that the conclusions there were as a result of a lot of cycles of hitting up against these limits and then building hypotheses against these and like changing our configuration and testing. But the choices are not, I mean, candidly, they're not good, right? So your choices are pausing trading, uh, trying to rebroadcast more gas, but keep in mind that you've already charged the user whatever gas that you computed at the time. So that's just like 
you're paying for that if you're rebroadcasting. So you have to make kind of an operational decision whether it's worth deploying with more gas to try to keep this, to try to compress the amount of lag there, or try to ride it out, or is there some bigger concern like network partitions that you're not seeing, you know? Yeah, so the problem, the news, users do notice that because, for example, if you're trying to do any sort of arbitrage, you need to be able to withdraw it. And as in the example we saw there, you can trade, 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 you want to withdraw. And if there's an hour lag, that withdrawal's not happening for an hour because it can't. It literally, you know, otherwise it's going to break the entire state uh, synchronization between the off-chain and on-chain components. So absolutely, there's definitely concern around that. Also, you know, that's just not a good user experience. So. Your hot wallet is not an EC2, right? Pardon? Uh, in terms of, yeah, it's an easy to. Why? Well, keep in mind, it's just the dispatch wallet, okay. right? So there's really, I mean, unless you want to pay our gas, like, you know, <laughs> there's not a whole. It's not a very interesting wallet, right? Uh, you know, it does, like it can't steal any funds. It doesn't have any control over user funds, right? Um, so that it's purely an operational concern of just you know effectively paying the gas fee for the transactions to go out and constraining the serialization of those transactions. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think it's very useful sharing on the dispatcher. Uh, since you mentioned multi-wallet is Yeah, that's right. So there's right now there's one wallet. Um, the contract supports multiple wallets. So if we wanted to do more than one, we can just add those to the uh, to the um, to the owner. Uh, excuse me, the admin set. And uh, once if we did that, we could just you know set up again as long as we compute the dependency graph correctly. And those things are not dependent. It's no problem to to dispatch. But today we just we don't do that. We just have one wallet. How many, how many transactions are we talking? Yeah, so uh, obviously it's quite peaky. Um, you know, we are in a bear market, so you know, things are not quite as hot as they have been at different times. Uh, we'll do over 30,000 transactions in a day. Um, so, you know, 30,000, yeah. So, you know, over 1,000 an hour. Um, and so we've seen that, that kind of volume. And like, again, this has kind of evolved through all these phases and it's gotten much, much more stable the last few months. Yeah. Uh, just maybe a naive question. Why do you send your separate orders as individual transaction nonce instead of batching them up in one transaction? It's a good question. So batching, uh, we looked at batching. So that was actually, of course, one of the areas that we explored. But the gas cost associated with them um, ultimately is not really meaningfully cheaper. Um, and it's just more complex. So when the contract was originally released, you know, again, it's very, very simple. It's focused on simplicity. Um, you could definitely validate more than one transaction in a go. Um, but again, you know, the, the thing that we're after here is essentially more throughput, lower gas, and the balance of what that really gets us in terms of batch dispatch is not really all that much. And uh, to a previous question here, deploying a new contract is really non-trivial. So we want to be, you know, when we deploy a new contract, we want to be really sure that the improvements are worthwhile. And we didn't see that um, batching gave us enough of improvement. It seems like you do not have the problem you mentioned earlier where you're using nonces and the miner has to get all the transactions in order, so she needs some more transactions. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Right, so that is that is an area that it could be an advantage. But again, you know, these are things, like some of these things are trade-offs, right, where it's like, okay, it's going to be a little more complicated. Okay, yeah, you know, we, we solve some of the propagation problems. Um, and so, you know, obviously, as we work through new contract logic and things that we want to add, something that we've weighed, you'll probably end up taking a look at it again. But yeah, so far, it hasn't tipped the scale quite over. Yeah? One more. Uh, have you considered, like, encrypting the address of your users in the contract? Uh, we have not, no. In fact, actually, we look at the transparency of it as, uh, as an asset, not a liability, right? So, you know, I mean, to your point, you know, there's, I guess there's to some degree a privacy element question there, but you know, our position is, look, this is blockchain, it's, it's there in perpetuity. We actually think that there's an advantage of that in that um, things like, you know, like the 
black box of the centralized exchange, you basically have to trust them to tell you what happened there. Whereas in this, anyone can go pull all of our data from you know day one, look at every single trade that happened. It's all public. We actually have a guide in our uh, API docs to explain what all the fields are and how they work and how to pull it all. So, you know, we've kind of embraced the idea that this is completely open. Give the, give the, the guide what address, what, what, what is the state address this so you can see these yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, I think it's a great, it's a great point. You know, I think there's a lot of measures if we wanted to go down that road of kind of obscuring things to do it. But I think you know, again, like our just from a product design perspective, went in the completely opposite direction of uh, transparency and clarity. It's you know very easy to read um, for anyone that is curious about what's actually happening on there. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's actually more of an issue with the So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of one answer. Yeah, because in the end, if it's a big transaction and if it doesn't fit in the block, you might want to pick up. So, you want to break it down as much as possible. Yeah, so that, that's another great point, right? So, I mean, you could batch a few together, but then, you know, if you, you can't make them too big, to your point, right? So, I have a question. Yeah. Thanks a lot for sharing your scaling stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so to be, so we did. We, yeah, yeah, we so we launched so we did. Uh, you know, we launched October of 2017, and you know the design was you know obviously in work quite a bit prior to that, and so we had a very specific perspective on how uh, the trade offs could be made. Um, and again, like I said, you know a lot of it was you know really prototype. It's like we're you know <laughs> working on Ethereum. Uh, you know, it's a brand new technology, and you know we're trying to really wrap our heads around like where we're going to hit up against limits. And obviously, we hit up against plenty of limits, even with something this simple. So, I think um, you know, I think there's a part of great design and great vision, but I think there's also, frankly, just a bit of luck in terms of getting this sweet spot of simplicity and capability that allowed it to be, you know, an actually popular product. Yeah. Uh, do you have a sense of which pieces of your system you have to move on chain to keep the SEC off? Like, is it the so, part, or like... To move on-chain for the SEC. Yeah, if, I mean, so, so I think the idea is that you guys, I mean, maybe they think since you're somewhat centralized and things back you, but maybe if you move the order book on-chain, or like, is there a certain piece of your system that they really latch onto and say, oh, so that's, you know, that this makes you, you know, going against sort of our rules. And if you move one of those pieces off on-chain, so you're not in direct control over it. Right. Like, is it the order book piece, or I'm just trying to figure well, out what exact piece they have like such an issue? So, obviously, I don't have any inside knowledge on the SEC or anything of that nature. Yeah, from you know, from our perspective, you know, we don't custody any funds, and I think you know, and there's even uh, you guys may have seen there's a bunch of hubbub on the internet around the fact that you know, is this really a DEX? It's a hybrid decentralized exchange, and you know, I think the best name for it really decentralized is a it's a loaded term with so many different facets to it, but really, uh, it's non-custodial. And you know, from the SEC perspective, I'm not sure whether that passes the test or not for them. Um, but you know, I'm sure they have an opinion. <laughs> we are, to be clear, though, we are actually working on decentralizing the decentralized components. Uh, if you guys are, it's a little bit outside of the scope of what we've done here in terms of the technical elements of it. It's in development now. Uh, we have uh, some great posts that talk about our plans here, but we. All the stuff that we're thinking about that's off-chain today, we that's centralized, uh, we absolutely do want to decentralize. So um, we're approaching this kind of in the same manner that we've approached a lot of things in this kind of just deeply pragmatic, um, kind of iterative, uh, keep it simple up front, step-by-step -step manner. Um, so the first phase of that uh, we're, we're currently in development on and really excited about it because, you know, again, you know, from our perspective, it's, you know, it's much less candidly, well, my opinion, not really, speaking for the company in general, but you know, I think one of the interesting things about taking these centralized components and making them decentralized is really about uh, setting governance in a very particular way, right? So it's saying, look, you know, we are taking, as a company, the company's taking steps that it's think, it thinks is right for the exchange and for the community and so forth and so on. The goal with turning all these things over to the community is saying, look, ultimately, the decision of what is right should be part of the community's decision, not just our decision. And that's kind of the real goal that we're after here, right? So, you know, 
seeing how that unfolds should be really, really interesting. But we're super excited to be able to involve uh, folks in you know, staking, providing services, and um, participating and you know, collecting part of the fees and the whole nine yards. So uh, it should be, should be great to see how that unfolds. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> So I was not involved with the project at that point. Um, the founding team uh, was uh, four folks that had been hacking on this stuff for a really long time and have, have gone through a lot of different uh, projects and iterations and built a considerable amount of Solidity code at the time to be fairly confident with it. But I think um, also we're just you know, relentlessly kind of MVP focused to saying, look, we have an idea. It's a very interesting concept. We think it has these trade-off capabilities. Let's Let's see what happens, right? You know, and uh, and ultimately, you know, found an incredible amount of user adoption. I think surprising even the team then. So, you know, it's very much that judgment call, of, like any startup, where you're like, okay, cool. You know, if you wait too long, you know, you're you're going to end up with a product that probably doesn't align with the market in a tight way, or you've wasted some time getting there. Uh, and I think they really hit the sweet spot in terms of saying, okay, clearly it's good enough to get some attention. Uh, clearly, we have a lot of work to do, <laughs> but it's much better to be doing that work on the side of, okay, we're going up the hockey stick than it is just like crickets and you know, no one's using it. Oh, yeah. We haven't hacked, but that is, that's not to say that you know, they're taking a product that effectively is prototype level and being like, oh man, it's down. And you're like, you know, what's that? Well, yeah, so, so the losing money thing. Again, you know, we love the non-custodial design too because, from an ops perspective, it's it's down. You're like, okay, that that stinks. That you know, people are not going to be able to trade, but people's funds are not at risk, right? They're they're saving the contract. Even if we never turned it back on, we just you know, whatever the organization disappeared, they would get their funds back after that escape patch period is over. And so you know, we can kind of be secure in that knowledge. And I think that that's provided a lot of confidence in our ability to be like, okay, we need to work these operational issues, but you know, no one's funds are ultimately at risk. Enough liquidity. Yeah. Um, so you know, so far we are pretty. We have a team that looks at which tokens to list. You know, from a technical perspective, we can add any uh, ERC twenty token. Obviously, at a baseline, we're you know doing what we can to uh, take good ones and quality ones and so forth and so on. Um, but you know, part of that is also measuring, getting us. I mean, there's no way to. Uh, say for sure, but to get a better sense of which ones people are excited about. Um, and so, you know, we try to list ones that we think are going to be um, well received and, you know, see what happens in the market. Yeah, so it's something that we are actively exploring. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're involved in Market Maker, I'm happy to chat afterwards. We can Kind of connect and so forth, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that we're exploring. Cool. Yeah. Uh, to, to what extent do you think governance could like uh, add value to the token and the initial use case? Um, and you mentioned briefly governance. Um, how do you see like um, sort of governance maybe with your product and just generally in the decentralized exchange platform? So our model, you know, I. I can't speak more broadly to kind of the market at large, but I'd say our model is pretty clear in terms of why we believe that you know staking is going to accrue value uh, for everyone involved, which is to say, you know, they're critical. They're, as we take those off-chain components and we uh, allow them to be operated in a in a decentralized way, and to anyone to operate a node that provides services to either the web client or the API or whatever it happens to be, and and connect those dots. Um, in order to do so, you're going to need to stake. Aura, which is the, the token for uh, Aura Labs here. And then as part of the staking model, you receive part of the trading fees, right? So there's just a direct link of saying, okay, cool, you're providing the service, great. The stake tokens allow you to collect revenue from the fees, and like, that's a, you know, it's very, very simple. Again, you know, they like, we like almost hit the nail, or constantly refraining in the office here, just saying, you know, keep it simple, right? Like these things, it's very, very complicated. You know, there's a lot of ambitious stuff going on and we're just like, we're saying, okay, cool, from an application perspective, what is gonna to work today? What can we do that's going to benefit our users today? How can we make that user experience as good as possible uh, while not kind of overreaching the bounds of the underlying technology, which is, you know, unfortunately pretty easy to do still, but, uh, you know, a lot of cool stuff coming. Yeah? Do you have a rough idea on how you want to go about this? 
decentralized it's more decentralized than Bitcoin right now. Yeah. You have more of those like this one than the way it is. No, so, uh, so you know, it's all, all this in public. We uh, did a bunch of blog posts on this. Um, and the plans, effectively, there's a three-tiered plan. So uh, the first tier is actually decentralizing the server serving of the order book and trade data. So um, that's going to be, uh, you know, and there's kind of progressive levels of staking in order to operate this stuff and, and probably uh, compute and hardware requirements and so forth as well. So, uh, pardon? Yeah, that's right. So, so effectively, the those nodes would be reading Ethereum and serving that, like in a very simple sense, serving that to the web client to be able to uh, have trade history and say, okay, cool, we know that trade history is valid. It's been read off the chain, but it's also done in a performant way that's you know more DDoS uh, res uh, resilient and so forth and so on. Um, the second phase is uh, around um, transaction arbiting. How do we actually ensure that these transactions get uh, dispatched around these things, and then running the order book. There's a third phase. So ultimately, um, you know, these different, we're just focused on the first part of this, is to say, how can we get this trade history working? And I think, you know, we look at it as a very iterative process of saying, let's get something live, let's see if there's interest, if there's adoption, how the economics really work out with it, and so forth. Because, you know, a lot of these things, to my mind, are quite difficult to predict and quite difficult to model. And in truth, you know, we can kind of uh, test these things in real life and see what happens, prototype, iterate, and figure out what's really working for people before we necessarily uh, kind of fully commit to a particular approach or model. So, you know, it's, like I said, we're, we're very much focused on phase one. We'll see what comes out of that. And we'll probably end up course correcting, candidly, you know, what our plans are later on just based on what we learn. Um, but again, the goal is absolutely to take that stuff and say, great, you know, we, we have no interest in uh, having these operated centrally necessarily, you know, our, our plan would be to just stake and operate ourselves just like anybody else, collect revenues from that to continue development um, of all the components. How big is your engineering team? So right now we're about 10. Awesome. We are hiring. We are hiring. Blockchain engineers, application engineers, uh, test engineers, so, uh, you know, maybe a little bit far and wide here, but... Um, Pardon? Uh, either. So it's up to folks to decide what they'd like to get paid. Um, but yeah, you know, we're lurking on some really, really cool stuff. Uh, not only, like I was just talking about, around decentralizing uh, the centralized components to it, um, that's something that's in active development. We're always looking at, uh, as you can tell from the theme of this talk, we're always looking at solutions for scalability. Um, obviously, you know, if you, anyone is at DevCon, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming out um, that people are working on, whether it's, you know, Layer 2 or whatever it is. So we're always keeping our eye on those things. Um, and, you know, really, I think, again, kind of to come full circle on, you know, my point at the top of the talk here, which is, we're genuinely one of the few dApps that's around today that people actually use. You know, we have, um, like I said, by far the uh, largest number of users in the DEX space, uh, large number of transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, fun fact, we peaked out at over 10% of over Ethereum transaction volume um, at peak times. So we see really interesting challenges that very few teams actually see. And I think, you know, there's a ton and ton of energy around um, infrastructure. And I think it's all great. I also think that it's a great opportunity for anyone that's going to say, hey, how can we actually apply this stuff in a really practical, straight ahead way of saying, okay, look, does this actually work for our users today or not? Um, so it's a bit of an unusual undertaking that way. You do the contract to hire? Yeah, absolutely. Which is that? Uh, mostly Node, uh, AWS, uh, pretty standard stuff, uh, Aurora, um, Redis, Elasticash, so forth and so on. And kind, of, kind of guess the rest. Yeah. Pardon? Ah, so we practice what we preach, or at least we joke that. So we actually have a completely decentralized uh, team. We're uh, folks literally from Vietnam to Slovakia. It's um, all around the world. Though we tend to mostly work North American hours in the engineering team. So, yeah. So have you thought of, uh, uh, so right now you're Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, so we're always looking at new sets, you know, aside from just scaling what's on Ethereum, we're always looking at new blockchains, right? Because, you know, we want to make sure that if there is, you know, if you could snap your fingers and have essentially the, you know, smart contract capabilities on something that had 10x or 100x the, uh, the throughput and, you know, much lower latencies in Ethereum, that would radically transform uh, what is possible in terms of scale and volume, right? It's just pretty directly correlated. So um, as a result, we, you know, we'd love to explore pretty much anything that comes around. Right. So cross, I mean, you know, cross chain would be amazing, right? The, again, kind of continuing the theme with what Roto is always things that we're keeping tabs on and, you know, usually prototyping against or testing out. But, you know, again, with this kind of relentless focus on, okay, what can actually be built here? You know, as for this part of the business, you know, we're, we're just application developers, you know, we're not necessarily, we're, we're not building protocols for this application. You know, we're, we're ultimately looking at a decentralized network, but, you know, we want to see that, okay, what can we build today that's going to actually get us to that? We'd love, I mean, we'd love to be able to do that, right? We'd love to be able to do cross-chain. We'd love to be able to do very fast settlements. We'd love to especially reduce gas costs. All those things are, you know, are so of massive interest. On the networking side, um, if you move to, to a faster consensus, what do you think your um, probability of the network In terms of? Uh, propagation. Okay. I'm not sure I follow. Um, like, like that we would implement or that, I mean, so, you know, none of it's public. <laughs> um, we are researching some of these things internally, but, uh, you know, propagation, I don't know that we're looking at anything in propagation in particular. As we're propagating it, um, we haven't really thought too much about it, just because you know ultimately, the security of the system is enforced at a, at a little bit of a different level. The transport level encryption doesn't actually matter all that much for us because you're signing everything that you're sending, and you can keep it plain text in a database, and it's like you know you can't change any of it and have it have it validated because the validation happens on contract in a very specific way. So even if people are you know playing with stuff in flight, it's just not going to validate on contract, so it just doesn't matter. That's kind of how we looked at it. I mean, we do obviously run everything on encrypted transport, but it's, strictly speaking, not really necessary. All right, is that it? One last. One last one. You gotcha. All right, um, this is about the average person entering crypto. Yeah. Um, it feels like, or um, I think it's a good question, yeah, yeah. crypto getting that mask is pretty complicated. It's really complicated. Um, so do you guys have Yeah, so, so first off, we're always interested in looking at wallet solutions and partnering with them and have, uh, have looked at a number that I think are quite interesting on this front, and it's really cool to see that people are experimenting with that. One of the, kind of philosophically, we look at this as a, we talk about whether there's intrinsic complexity or whether it's merely poor product design in terms of some of these experiences. And candidly, at this point, a lot of it, as far as we can tell, is just intrinsic complexity. Like, the fact that you have to know about asymmetric encryption. Like, this is crazy talk, right? Like private key, public key. Like what, no, no normal person should know about how any of this stuff works in order to be able to use the underlying services, right? So we understand that it's, it's niche at this point, right? It kind of has to be just based on the, those intrinsic limits, right? Um, but you know, when you see people doing all sorts of wallet solutions that are like, okay, great. It just like, looks like you log in, there's 2FA, and you know, it's all the magic of the wallet happens in the back end. Those are starting to look like things that people, you can imagine normal people being like, oh, I get this, I put in my email, and so forth and so on. So, like, like, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot, you know, man, there, there is a lot of intrinsic complexity here that I think is extremely difficult to communicate, even for people that are savvy in the space, that never mind, like, how far up that kind of S adoption curve you need to go before, you know, you start hitting the inflection point of normal people saying, I get it, 
I like it. It does something for me that I understand and you know, I can go on. So um, yeah, again, like I said, we're really keen to pick our battles. <laughs> you know, we have a limited amount of bandwidth. You know, there's uh, what's actually possible with today's technology as opposed to like all the super cool things that are happening in the infrastructure world is real limitations on this business that, you know, we have to work within. And so I think, you know, IDEX is kind of interesting on that front just because it is kind of one of those hacks of like, how can we layer great product design on top of the constraints that are intrinsic here and thus get some really nice benefits like genuinely great security, um, but still have a a pretty great user experience, and that's kind of you know. So we're we're definitely thinking along those lines, but uh, yeah, it's tricky. It's a lot, it's a lot. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on. There's no doubt about it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you guys.